Hi, welcome to the Linux Foundation Open Source Summit 2021. My name is Venkat. I work as a senior architect at Razorpay, and I have with me my colleague Srinidhi, who works as a senior software engineer at Razorpay. Today, we would love to talk about our journey into improving our developer experience and actually how we built a cloud native dev stack for hundreds of engineers. A quick preview into what Razorpay does Razorpay enables frictionless payment, banking, and lending experience for merchants of various scale and sizes. Today, we process billions of transactions for millions of merchants across the country. In the last five years of our existence, Razorpay has been in the forefront of a lot of payment and technology innovation in the country. A quick overview of what our growth metrics looks like. Uh, and this is sort of a motivating factor in terms of why we in fact went ahead to even embark on this journey. Over the last four years, our engineering headcount has grown by about 10x. Uh, we have actually scaled out to full-fledged pods and BUs, four BUs to be precise, and about 30 plus pods as we are still growing. Uh, we have about 100 microservices in production. Over the last two years alone, we have about 50 plus microservices and it's still growing. Uh, we have acquired three companies in the last three years, and that has led to a polyglot stack with multiple languages that we have uh, in operation today. And th that also means that we have about 1,500 deployments per month that is sort of going on. A quick overview of what our CICD practice looks like and the motivation again for uh, this particular uh, talk itself. Um, traditional development process, developers raise their PRs or commit code onto GitHub. Uh, we use GitHub Actions as a uh, continuous uh, for doing a lot of our build and operations. This is uh, something that has evolved over the last five years. We have gone through a variety of CSED stacks, and this picture that you're seeing here uh, is what we have today. So GitHub Actions is used generally for creating all our build images, uh, running through you know basic unit tests uh, and a variety of other things with integration to report portal and a bunch of other uh, reporting tools. Uh, once the images are available, uh, how the, a developer would be able to deploy their code on a pre-prod environment. Uh, we use Spinnaker as a continuous deployment tool. Spinnaker, for those of you who do not know, is an open source uh, platform created by Netflix. So in Spinnaker, we run a bunch of tests, whether it's integration tests, whether it is uh, uh, performance tests or any other tests. And once the developer is satisfied uh, with the test run, they go on to deploy their code onto a canary infrastructure in production. Uh, we heavily rely upon canary infrastructure for many use cases, Primarily because uh, you know our work uh, literally uh, you know harps on to one of the most sensitive aspects of human life, which is uh, people's money. So we need to be really really careful in terms of how we roll out code to production. So developers deploy their code to Canary. Um, Spinnaker again provides a mechanism called Kayanta. Uh, we uh, deploy a lot of threshold tests on Canary uh, with our monitoring infrastructure on Prometheus uh, to our distributed tracing to whatnot. And once these Canary thresholds pass the deployment is automatically promoted to production. In case the thresholds fail, the deployment is reverted back. Uh, pretty much, uh, we use uh, all our infrastructure runs on AWS. Uh, we are, uh, by the way, we probably are the first in the country, in India at least, to have gone in with a full-grade full, full grade production, uh, full-blown production-grade Kubernetes infrastructure somewhere in late 2016. Um, today, we have rewritten all of our infrastructure to run on EKS, uh, which is uh, AWS's managed version of Kubernetes. Uh, again, since we are on Kubernetes, we have a heavy dependency on Helm charts. All of our uh, deployments are packaged as Helm charts. Spinnaker is something that we spoke about. Uh, and the entire infrastructure uh, is again in code in Terraform. And specifically for making this self-serve, we have we are using an open source framework called Atlantis uh, that allows uh, that allows developers to freely provision infrastructure uh, uh, you know, in a self-serve fashion. And again, GitHub Actions is something that uh, we already spoke about, which is the CI part of the story. Now, uh, one thing that might be quite obvious is that this, this is typically uh, a development process that, that happens for every single feature release uh, you know, in, in, in more than many ways. And a lot of time goes in um, primarily because of uh, the way uh, the CACD process is constructed. Uh, and this CACD process is not very different from uh, you know, many other places, uh, independent of whether it's a continuous deployment or otherwise. Uh, there are always going to be challenges in terms of how you roll out code to production and what it primarily means is that there are development challenges which actually hinder agility and that hindered our productivity. Um, a quick uh, overview of what some of the challenges look like. Uh, on, on, on the first side, what we have is uh, general sequential development challenges. Um, 
today because of the number of developers that we have and also because of our microservices journey um, the development process is largely sequential and what we mean by that is well there could be uh, you know tons of developers are working on a particular uh, repository uh, each one has a dependency in terms of how the features are getting rolled out uh, and they have to sort of you know, coordinate amongst themselves in terms of even if it is a two-member team to a five-member team to a fifty-member team, uh, the process is in terms of coordinating how development can actually happen in a more systematic fashion. Uh, the second part of the problem is that we have a lot of dependency on uh, AWS specific cloud services like SQS, SNS, um, etc. Most of this is today mocked uh, uh, in uh, a local dev environment that reduces the confidence um, uh, uh, to begin with. Uh, the other part of the problem is that even a single change, um, uh, you know, a single commit requires this entire process of the CI plus Spinnaker plus deployment plus a bunch of the things. On the right hand side uh, is our problems very specifically with the shared environment. And what do we mean by a shared environment? What uh, is, is that I as a developer, if I'm working on a service, uh, I'm only going to be working on one service and I don't probably require uh, multiple copies of dependent services to be running um, uh, in, in production, uh, in, in a pre-prod environment. And because I have a dependency on another service, uh, it's quite possible that another developer who's working on the dependent service could have actually made change, which could be breaking my test. So how do you actually scale out uh, you know, these shared environments for you know, hundreds of developers and also for hundreds of services? That's one side of the story in a cost-effective fashion. Uh, the other part of the problem is because of the fact that you know there are these shared environments, how do you meaningfully demo uh, feature changes to product and business teams uh, without actually bothering about uh, another developer overriding uh, my changes? Uh, the third part of the problem is today in our world, we have uh, our a lot of our work depends on integration with third party uh, partners, gateways and, and banking providers and a bunch of other things. So many of these integrations sometimes can run from days to weeks. Uh, which also means that uh, this every developer, whoever is integrating with these partners or gateways, they need to have an environment that is exposed for several weeks sometimes. And how do you sort of really keep it up and running, uh, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in, a, in a seamless fashion? Uh, the other set of problems are, again, in terms of infrastructure provisioning itself. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, all our infrastructure is in code uh, via Terraform. Even though we have Atlantis, there is a burden uh, on the developers to actually learn uh, Terraform DSL uh, to be able to provision uh, most of the infrastructure that, uh, that is needed. The other part is in terms of the debugging challenges itself. Uh, and like I mentioned, uh, because every code commit goes through an entire development and deployment process, uh, even to debug a simple code break, uh, the developers are going to go through a lot of context switch between the actual application which is running to actually going ahead and looking at uh, something like a trace or something like logs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the other part of the problem is the time that it takes to build and deploy the code itself. Um, again, the once the code is committed, there is an entire uh, pipeline of uh, building the Docker image, running the unit test, and actually pushing the, pushing the image to uh, the central Docker registry. Uh, this takes a significant amount of time. And uh, testing small features, again, uh, it just increases the burden on time. Uh, for the developers to actually be able to uh, move faster uh, with quality. So going through all of these things, um, you know, what we actually realized was that a lot of time is actually getting spent uh, on, the on the developers themselves. A, a lot of this time that can be used for doing a lot of productive things uh, while it is actually getting spent only on development, uh, only, only on deployment um, challenges itself, which means that we need to have a way to simplify the developer workflow and also it means that we need to reduce the time for rolling out features while each developer can independently operate without having dependency on other developers. With that, I'd like to hand, hand it over to Srinidhi, my colleague, who will walk you through how you've tried to solve this problem. Thanks, Venkat, uh, for the brief uh, introduction. And talking about the goals of the project, we are primarily focusing on reducing the cognitive load on developers. And that is being achieved by one, having a streamlined workflow, two, having environmental consistency, and three, providing a faster feedback loop from local development. Uh, the following are the key decision factors on which the solution was built upon. The first one being to rely completely on open source and have zero vendor lock-in. 
uh, the next one is uh, to make sure that the solution is Kubernetes native as our environments are in Kubernetes. Uh, the third important one is to have a hassle-free onboarding, which means that we wanted to onboard application with minimal changes and also not drastically change the development or deployment life cycle. And last but not the least, we wanted to have a cost effective solution that will make sure that we don't burn cash in order to get the ephemeral infrastructure. Our solution is lightly opinionated and is what fits our use cases best and is not a complete pass solution. So the code name of this particular uh, solution is DevStack and this is a razor based journey towards a better development life cycle. So let's try to understand the solution by asking uh, a series of question and answers and coming to a logical conclusion before the demo. The first one is on how do we bypass the CI CD loop for the iterative development and the need is to have uh, directly expose the local code onto the cloud environment. So as a v1 version of the solution, we went ahead with telepresence, which followed a proxy based approach. So telepresence was a client that was sitting in both the local system and the remote cluster and made sure the connection happens through a tunnel. It took care of the DNS resolution, volume mounting and also networking. But there was a major drawback due to the whole tunneling approach, which was that the uh, responses were slow, the connectivity issues were with the database and also sometimes connectivity issues with the uh, cluster in itself and also uh, along with VPN, there were a lot of uh, bottlenecks. So how do we avoid the network limitations and uh, how can we ship code to the remote container without relying on the network? Uh, so we had to shift the approach towards a file sync based where uh, we used a tool called DevSpace. So DevSpace syncs the local code into the remote container in a very efficient manner and it also does live reloading by container restart. DevSpace also has port forwarding and log streaming that provided scope for further features. Uh, as, as it all looked good, uh, there was an hiccup, sort of a limitation per se due to the container restarts. So the container restarts, which are bound by Kubernetes probe, uh, were flaky at times and also uh, not completely reliable. So we wanted something that was better and faster. So the next question is on how do we avoid this container restarts? So in order to avoid the container restarts, we had to put in a library inside the container that will take care of the hot reloading. So there are a lot of libraries per language uh, like compile daemon for Golang, nodemon for Node.js and so on, who rely on watching for the files that are changed these are the files that are synced by uh, DevSpace and then it rebuilds the binary and then runs the new one, which is made available to the server. So this effectively avoids the container restart, thus not breaking the flow. So we could have a generic Docker container per language build and use that container with the DevSpace command in order to make sure this <clears throat> onboarding is seamless. So all of these three questions helped us to solve the problem of local sync. So we now short circuited the feedback loop by just running a command. So next question is on uh, how do we provide or orchestrate multiple services? How can the developers declaratively define and apply service dependencies? And uh, the solution for that is Helm file, which is a wrapper on top of Helm. So Helm file helps us to compose several charts together to create a comprehensive deployment artifact for anything from a single application to the entire infrastructure tag, stack. Uh, so we define a term called uh, service fleet here, which is a collection of microservices that are required by the developer for his or her workflows. Uh, so this Helm file works seamlessly with the existing Helm packages as all of our applications already had Helm packages and we didn't want to or uh, need to write uh, extra thing. We just had to wrap all of them in a single YAML file and provide it as it is given in the uh, 
uh, in this right side of the uh, of the screen. So Helm file when uh, took care of all the Kubernetes resources orchestration uh, and that solved major of a problem with respect to providing Kubernetes resources like your deployment service, ingress, job, cron job and uh, whatnot. But uh, the application is not wholesome without the other requirements, which are like, for example, uh, SQSs or databases or AWS resources, which are not completely on Kubernetes. So the next question is on how do we provision ephemeral infrastructure resources? So we used or uh, relied upon Helm hooks for this provisioning. So Helm hooks provided a plug and play model to maintain the dynamics of applications auxiliary requirements. What we mean by that is uh, we have written uh, two to three uh, or per requirement based uh, Helm hooks, which can be plugged into application based on a requirement. So if, for example, an application is using SQS queues, they can plug in a SQS configurator as a hook, whereas an application using Kafka queues could plug in a Kafka configurator. Similarly, for all the other resources, the plug and play model will fit in. And in order to also avoid the uh, AWS overridden or maintaining AWS resources, which was done via Terraform, we used local stack, which provided a framework for mocking AWS components. So this is how a Helm file workflow will look like. On running the command, uh, the chart is being verified and it runs a bunch of uh, pre-installed hooks, which makes sure that the auxiliary requirements for the application is up. And then it loads the charts, the Kubernetes resources and deploys them into the Kubernetes cluster. And then does some post install hooks as well, which will, which can include like uh, the ingress route configuration or uh, validation of the manifest generated and make sure that the ephemeral service or the ephemeral infrastructure per developer is available by just running one command. So this is how we solve the problem of having a streamlined workflow for the developers in order to bring up their ephemeral service fleet. So now with uh, uh, ephemeral infrastructure using Helm file and local sync using dev space, uh, there is one piece in the whole puzzle that needs to be sorted, which is on how do we make sure the traffic is routed to the right user service. So for that, we use header-based routing our ecosystem or our Kubernetes cluster have uh, have been using traffic for ingresses and uh, we upgraded that to traffic 2.0 which supported header based uh, routing out of the box. So the traffic ingress route configuration will have multiple rules in order to uh, guide it to the dynamic routing. So for example, in, in the right hand side of the presentation, uh, we have two services, uh, which are uh, API Web and API Web Srinidhi. And based on the header, uh, traffic will make sure that the request that uh, comes with the header is propagated to the API Web Srinidhi service, which in turn puts the request into the API Web Srinidhi deployment or a pod. Uh, so this is how we have enabled uh, header-based routing to solve the uh, routing problem. And uh, the next set of uh, question is on how do we make sure the upstream services are routed uh, properly as well. And we use header propagation there. And we have piggybacked on open tracing where open tracing by default uh, uh, propagates the header. And we rely on that uh, where at every service, the traffic will read the header and route it to the appropriate service. Let's walk through a use case on, on how does that routing work, uh, the routing overview. Uh, for example, let's take a use case where we have two applications, app one and app two, and assume app one being a gateway service and app two is an actual service that uh, prop processes a request and gives in uh, response. Uh, so we have three developers who are working on uh, both of these microservices where developer one is explicitly working on app one and developer two is working on app two. Whereas developer three is working on a feature that spans between app one and app two. 
Now, by running the Helm file command, the developers would have configured the infrastructure. Now, let's see how the request routing happens. So, developer one, on passing the request uh, header dev one in the request, uh, the ingress route. Uh, that is uh, present in front of app one will make sure that the request is routed to the dev one instance of the app one and then the request will propagate into the uh, app two and given that the dev one label is not present in the configuration it will route it to the default shared infrastructure uh, so taking into a use case of uh, the second uh, developer on passing the header dev2 into the request, the request will flow into the shared stage infrastructure of application one, as there is no instance of uh, dev2 running here, and it would propagate it to the dev2 instance of the uh, app2 version that is running because the configuration would be there and also in the last case when the header feature one is passed the request will be routed to the feature one instance of app one and then the feature one instance of the app two as both of these are present so this is how the request routing will now happen across the microservices and uh, this enables us in order to run only a subset of microservices required for the functioning of the application all the other routing can happen smartly to the stage infrastructure that is already there and running uh, with the header based configuration so let's move on to some of the practical implementation of this solution and see how it works in real world and uh, this is the demo Let's open our terminal and run a command now, which will enable us to create a, the ephemeral infrastructure. Helm file sync uh, is the command that is required. And uh, the command now has started to create ephemeral resources for a couple of services. And let's look into what they are uh, while the build is happening or the deployment is happening. Uh, so we have uh, a file called helm file.yml which will define the service fleet. So in this case, we have used two services, dashboard, which is a front end of RazorPay, and API, which is a back end of RazorPay, and API is being written in PHP. The image here is the commit ID of the dep of the branch that I'm working on, and also the same is the Docker image tag. So the image tag we use in RazorPay is uh, the commit uh, hash of the uh, of the branch that we are working on. And just take a notice of one thing, which is called the dev stack label. So this particular label holds the key for the ephemeral infrastructure. All of our infrastructure ephemerally are created with the suffix of this uh, this particular uh, label. So now that the Helm file has completed its job, it has created uh, ephemeral resources for API and dashboard, and it says how we can access it. So we'll have to either access it via passing a header for header propagation or using the URL directly, which is a preview URL. Uh, the same thing works for the other microservices as well. Let's quickly check what are the Kubernetes resources that it has created. So when I do kubectl get pods hyphen and API, we can see that there is a Srinidhi demo that is running. And also if we can just check the dashboard resources, there is also be a Srinidhi demo that is running. Also take a notice of all the other labels that are working this and this is the live uh, infrastructure that we are running on and all the other developers are parallelly working while we are demoing. So this is the standard uh, uh, dashboard of RazorPay. Let's see how we can access our specific resource. So we'll use a plugin called uh, mod header, which injects the header into the request that go through your browser. You can also use Postman by adding this header or use curl request to, to add the header. So let me now just refresh the page to see whether the changes of my branch are being reflected. And uh, as you can see, the color has changed to green, which is the feature that we are uh, uh, 
uh, probably demoing. So let's go and see the code of uh, the same branch that is there and the color is uh, green. So now at this point of time, we have created ephemeral infrastructure separate from the all the developers working and we can access it by giving just a header. So let's just see how we can work on iteratively working on the feature from the local code. So we just change the uh, content in the file, go to our uh, terminal, run another command called dev space dev. So dev space dev takes care of syncing the local code into the remote cluster. So in this case, the code in user Srinidhi code app API is being synced into slash app slash app and also the service PHP file which I just changed is being shown as synced. So we we'll, can quickly validate that by refreshing the page and uh, seeing the seeing whether the color has got changed. And uh, here you go, the color has now changed to blue. So let's for some reason I don't like this color. Let's go ahead and change it to another one and see how it will reflect. So I'll change the color or change the code in my IDE, go to my browser and refresh. So dev space in the backend would have synced the file automatically and the change is reflected in my browser. So this is how simple the workflow will be with the adoption to the dev stack. And this particular example is for an interpreted language uh, like PHP and we'll just jump into another example where we see how a compiled language like Go works. Now for the demo purposes, we have already created uh, uh, another service called Capital Cards, uh, which uh, deals with uh, the cards uh, uh, of uh, Razorpay. And we'll just walk through the Helm uh, templates before going into the uh, demo. So there are multiple deployments that are present, which are your Kubernetes resources. Uh, these are the hooks that uh, we mentioned about, which will be run as either post install or pre install. So this is an ingress route configurator, which will update the ingress route. Uh, there is a preview URL hook as well. There is a secret updater uh, hook that runs, uh, uh, which updates the secret. And there is also a SQS configurator. So this particular application is an asynchronous one with the web worker and SQS queues. And we are configuring SQS queues dynamically and also having a service which is a Kubernetes resource. So now that uh, we have already created the deployments, let's just validate that. So on doing the kubectl get pods, uh, there are the web and uh, the worker pods that are created. We can also go ahead and see the SQS resources that are created and this is the local stack UI. So this is the particular SQS queue that is created for capital cards and this is the URL in which it can be accessed. So likewise, we have created the Kubernetes resources and also the ephemeral infrastructure resources. Let's run the dev space command in order to sync our local code into the uh, remote cluster. And uh, on inspection, while the sync is happening, let's walk through the dev space YAML file. So it has multiple uh, uh, divisions where it replaces the pods with the dev stack uh, Docker container that we built, which is nothing but the compiled daemon one. And then it syncs our local code into the remote. And also it excludes a few paths which will optimize the syncing. So these are the files that are probably not required for the uh, for the binary to work. And also it has logs part where we can see the logs of the container that we have synced with. Let's see the status of the dev space command. And yes, it has started to uh, run the command. Uh, it has started to sync, which is basically uh, at this point where it, where it synced the code and then it is uh, running the build command, which is nothing but the go build uh, hyphen O and then it has run it, run the binary that has been built. And these are the logs that it prints in order to make sure that the debugging is easier. So let's just access this by making a curl request. And he, as you can see, the request is now reaching because I have used a preview URL. Uh, so let's just go ahead and make some change into the code, which is a Golang code. So what we'll do is probably add the add the loggers in order to uh, print the request logging. So there are two loggers that I have uh, commented out. 
I'll just uncomment it and save the file. So right now the workflow is that dev space watching these file changes has synced the file of helpers, which is there here. And then the same process of uh, building and running the uh, new binary is, has happened. And let's just validate that by hitting a request. And here you go. The changes that I've done are being reflected dynamically in an interpreted language as well. Moving on uh, to the additional features uh, that are supported by DevStack. The first one is the preview URL. Uh, and as uh, seen in the demo, this creates a specific URL uh, per dev stack label for an application by using the ingress route and the preview URL uh, configuration is provided in the slide. Uh, the next part of it is the ephemeral databases. We currently support three different ways of configuring the database, which are one, a local database where the developers run their uh, a DB instance locally, and we reverse proxy the request into the local system. The second one is the ephemeral database where developers can span ephemeral databases based on the uh, preceded data and also make sure that the schema is synced with the pre prod environment and also have the dev migrations run. The last one is the persistent database where the developers can opt to use a pre-existing uh, database of uh, stage or beta or a pre-prod, which is regularly controlled by the data ops flow. So the workflow of an ephemeral database is, is that we copy the stable stage environment into S3, which is acting as a base. And then the data container based on this will be generated and uh, migrations run on top of it, which gives an ephemeral database, which is isolated from others. So are we really looking into the cost? Uh, the primary goal of us to is to have a cost optimal solution, right? Uh, so cube generator is the tool that takes care of all the cleanups. So our resources, all of the ephemeral resources uh, have been tagged with a TTL of six hours by default and the developers can override it based on their requirements. So generator will make sure that it cleans up the resources when the TTL is expired. And also in order to solve the requirements of ups and downs, uh, the upscaling and downscaling, we use cluster auto scaler and spot nodes. Uh, we also do monitoring of uh, all of these resources via Prometheus, where we attach labels to every deployment and all of them are queried in a Grafana dashboard. So this is how the solution looks like in from the angle of uh, uh, tools where we have different uh, components of dev orchestrator, uh, cluster manager, infra monitoring and routing. And uh, this particular diagram specifically explains us how the pre and post dev stack will be, where a sequential development workflow is replaced by multiple parallel ecosystem of uh, things working with local sync. Uh, what is the impact on dev productivity? We have seen a 10 to 15x reduction in time to take feature live because per feature, the time has been reduced from five hours to 30 minutes and per iterations, it has come down to two minutes, which was 20 to 30 minutes earlier due to container builds and all the other regular process. So these are the, some of the features that we are planning to uh, go ahead. And uh, given that we emphasize on open source, we wanted to give back to the community as well, which is where we are recording all of the details and reference implementation in this open source repo. Feel free to raise issues or contribute back in order to make developers' life easier. Thank you and any questions?